بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم our first integral is x from 0 to infinity of log the fourth power of the hyperbolic sine of x divided by the square root of the hyperbolic cosine of 2x let's do the change of variables the hyperbolic sine of x equal to the square root of y when x is 0 y is 0 when x tends to infinity y tends to infinity the hyperbolic cosine of x dx is 1 half y to the minus 1 half dy the hyperbolic cosine of x is the square root of 1 plus the square of the hyperbolic sine of x so this part is the square root of 1 plus y dx is 1 half times 1 over the square root of y times 1 over the square root of 1 plus y dy. Inside the logarithm, we get y squared, that's 2 log y. In the denominator, we have the square root of the hyperbolic cosine of 2x. The hyperbolic cosine of 2x is the square root of 1 plus 2 times the square of the hyperbolic sine of x. Thus, in the denominator, we have the square root of 1 plus 2y. The integral of interest is equal to the integral over positive y of log y over the square root of y times 1 plus y times 1 plus 2y. Let's do another change of variables, y equal to 1 over 2t. dy is minus 1 over 2, dt over t squared. When y tends to 0 from above, t tends to infinity. When y tends to infinity, t tends to 0 from above. We can use the minus sign to have the integral with respect to t from 0 to infinity. This is dy without the minus sign. Log y is minus 2 log 2t, which is minus log 2 minus log t. This is the denominator in terms of t. We also have 2t squared, which can be written as the square root of 2 times t times the square root of 2t times the square root of t. The square root of t times the square root of 1 plus 1 over t is the square root of 1 plus t. The square root of 2t times the square root of 1 plus 1 over 2t is the square root of 1 plus 2t. Finally, the square root of 2 times t over the square root of t times the square root of t is the square root of t. We can split this integral into two integrals, written here using the dummy variable of integration y. Note that this part is exactly the negative of this integral, which is the integral of interest. If the integral of interest is i, i is equal to minus i minus log 2 times this integral. So the integral of interest is minus log 2 over 2, integral over positive y of 1 over the square root of y, the square root of 1 plus y, the square root of 1 plus 2y. Now to our third change of variables, which will allow us to write the integral of interest in terms of the beta function. Specifically, we use variable t equal to 1 over the square of 1 plus 2y. Using this substitution, 1 over the square root of 1 plus 2y is equal to t to the power 1 over 4. If we take the reciprocal of both sides, we get 1 plus 2y squared equal to t to the minus 1. 1 plus 2y is t to the minus 1 half. 2y is t to the minus 1 half minus 1. y is 1 half times t to the minus half minus 1 half. If this is y, then 1 plus y is 1 half t to the minus half plus 1 half. y times 1 plus 1 is the square of this part, minus 1 fourth. That's 1 fourth t to the minus 1 minus 1 fourth. Under the square root, we get the square root of t to the minus 1 minus 1. The square root is divided by 2. Multiply upstairs and downstairs by 2 times the square root of t. We get 2, the square root of t, divided by the square root of 1 minus t dy is minus 1 over 4 t to the minus 3 over 2 dt when y is 0 t is 1 when y tends to infinity t tends to 0 from above we can use this minus sign to have our integral from 0 to 1 this is dy without the minus sign 2 goes away with 2 we still have 1 fourth inside the integral we have 1 minus t to the power minus 1 half we also have t to the power 1 half plus 1 fourth minus 3 over 2 this is minus 3 over 4 when z1 and z2 have real parts strictly greater than 0, beta of z1 and z2 is integral t from 0 to 1, t to the z1 minus 1, 1 minus t to the power z2 minus 1. This integral is beta of minus 3 over 4 plus 1, which is 1 fourth, and minus 1 half plus 1, that's 1 half. Beta of z1 and z2 is gamma of z1, gamma of z2, divided by gamma of the sum z1 plus z2. We get gamma of 1 fourth, gamma of 1 half, which is the square root of pi, Downstairs, we get gamma of 3 over 4. When z is not an integer, gamma of z, gamma 1 minus z, is equal to pi over sine by z. If z is 1 fourth, we get that gamma of 1 over 4 times gamma of 3 over 4 is equal to pi over sine pi over 4. That's 1 over the square root of 2. On the right-hand side, we get pi times the square root of 2. So 1 over gamma of 3 over 4 is equal to gamma of 1 over 4 divided by pi times the square root of 2. The integral of interest is minus log 2 over 4 times the square root of 2 times 1 over the square root of pi times the square of gamma of 1 fourth. 
The second integral is x from 0 to pi over 4 cosine theta, which is a real parameter. The logarithm of the tangent of x. Use the substitution. Log 10 x equal to minus pi t. When x is pi over 4, we get log 1, so t is 0. When x tends to 0 from above, minus the logarithm tends to plus infinity. x is the inverse tangent of e to the minus pi t. dx is 1 over 1 plus the square of this exponential, e to the minus 2 pi t. By the chain rule, we have minus pi e to the minus pi t dt. Multiply numerator and denominator by 2 times e to the pi t. Our integral is equal to pi over 2 integral t from 0 to infinity of cosine minus pi t eta, which is cosine by t eta, times the hyperbolic secant of pi t. We go for the general following result, integral over t from minus infinity to infinity of the hyperbolic secant of pi t times e to the minus pi 2 pi f t, where f is real, is the hyperbolic secant of pi f. Note that what we have on the left-hand side is the continuous time Fourier transform of the hyperbolic secant of pi t. The Fourier transform is the function itself, this function is an eigenfunction of the continuous line Fourier transform. Note that this integral is finite. The magnitude of the integral by the triangle inequality for integrals is upper bounded by the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the hyperbolic secant of pi t times the magnitude of this exponential, which is 1. The integrand can be written as 2 over e to the pi the absolute value of t plus e to the minus pi the absolute value of t multiplied numerator and denominator by e to the minus pi the absolute value of t this part is upper bounded by the numerator, which is integrable. Because the hyperbolic secant function is an even function, we can change the integrand into the hyperbolic secant times cosine 2 pi ft. The integrand is cosine 2 pi ft divided by the hyperbolic cosine of pi t. Let's do contour integration. On the real axis, we go from minus big R to big R. R is a positive real number. The contour has a vertical part from R to R plus I. That's a height of unity. Then it moves from R plus I to minus r plus i, then to minus r. Where are the poles of the integrand? Equate the hyperbolic cosine of pi t to 0. This is equivalent to the equation cosine i pi t equal to 0. So i by t is an odd multiple of pi over 2. The poles of the integrand are on the imaginary axis. They have the form n plus 1 half times i, where n is an integer. Among the poles, the pole that lies inside the contour is at i over 2. The pole is simple. The contour integral is 2 pi i, the limit as t approaches i over 2 of 2 cosine 2 pi ft, t minus i over 2 over e to the pi t plus e to the minus pi t. If we replace this t by i over 2, we get cosine pi fi, which is the hyperbolic cosine of pi f. Here we have a 0 over 0 situation. We can apply L'Hopital's rule. The ratio of derivatives is 1 over pi e to the pi t minus pi e to the minus pi t. If we set t equal to i over 2, we obtain 2 pi i sine pi over 2, which is 2 pi i. Since applying L'Hopital's rule in the complex case may be tricky, another way of doing things is to do the Taylor series expansion of the denominator about i over 2. The constant term is 2 cosine pi over 2, which is 0. Then we have a linear term, pi e to the pi i over 2 minus pi e to the minus pi i over 2. This is multiplied by t minus i over 2. Then we have big O of the magnitude squared of t minus i over 2. If we divide upstairs and downstairs by t minus i over 2, we get 1 over this part here, which is 2 pi i sine pi over 2 plus big O of the magnitude of t minus i over 2. As t tends to i over 2, we end up with 1 over 2 pi i. The contour integral is equal to 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of pi f. Let's focus on the value of the contour integral on this part of the contour. On this part, the complex value t is r plus i u, where u is real valued and is between 0 and 1. Every t is replaced by r plus i u. Apply the triangle inequality. The magnitude of the integral is upper bounded by the integral of the magnitude. The magnitude of the numerator is upper bounded by the magnitude of this part, which is e to the minus 2 pi fu, plus the magnitude of that part, which is e to the 2 pi fu. This is the reverse triangle inequality. It implies that 1 over the magnitude of z2 minus z1 is upper bounded by 1 over the magnitude of the magnitude of z1 minus the magnitude of z2. 1 over the magnitude of this denominator is upper bounded by 1 over the magnitude of the magnitude of this part, which is e to the pi r, minus the magnitude of that part, which is e to the minus pi r. Since this is a positive real number, we can remove the magnitude. This is the upper bound on the magnitude of the integrand. We can take this part outside the integral. The integral is finite for every value of f. So when we take the limit as r tends to infinity, we get 0. In a similar fashion, we can also show that the integral on this part of the contour tends to 0 as r tends to infinity. 
we are left with two integrals, the integral on the real axis from minus r to r, and the integral from r plus i to minus r plus i. The complex value t here can be written as i plus u. u is real valued, and it is from r to minus r. The denominator is minus between brackets e to the pi u plus e to the minus pi u. The minus sign makes the integral from minus r to r. Two over this bracket gives us the hyperbolic cosine of yi in the denominator. Now we can combine the two integrals as an integral u from minus r to r. Downstairs, we have the hyperbolic cosine of pi u. Upstairs, we have cosine 2 pi f u plus cosine 2 pi f between brackets u plus i. The numerator is cosine 2 pi f u plus cosine 2 pi f u times cosine 2 pi f i minus sine 2 pi f u times sine 2 pi f i. When we integrate from minus r to r, sine over hyperbolic cosine is an odd function, so the integral is equal to zero. We can remove this part. From here, we can take cosine 2 pi f u as a common factor. Between brackets, we have 1 plus cosine 2 pi f i. This is the hyperbolic cosine of 2 pi f. This bracket is equal to 2 times the square of the hyperbolic cosine of pi f. Then we have the integral. When r tends to infinity, the variable of integration goes from minus infinity to infinity. The integrand is cosine 2 pi f u over the hyperbolic cosine of pi u. Here is our contour. Using the residue theorem, the contour integral with one simple pool at i over 2 gave us 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of pi f. The integral over this part and that one both tend to 0 as r tends to infinity. The integral from minus r to r plus the integral from r plus i to minus r plus i is the integral of cosine over hyperbolic cosine multiplied by 2 and the square of this hyperbolic cosine. If we divide both sides by 2 times the square of the hyperbolic cosine, we get that the integral of interest is equal to the hyperbolic secant of pi f because the integrand is even. If we integrate from 0 to infinity, the value of the integral is 1 half times the hyperbolic secant of pi f. Going back to our integral x from 0 to pi over 4 of cosine eta log tan x, this integral is equal to that one multiplied by pi over 2. f is replaced by eta over 2. The integral of interest is pi over 4 times the hyperbolic secant of pi eta over 2.